Very interesting, and I, I'm, I've, I've just pulled up Ken Paxton's statement. He just put this out a few moments ago, and he is saying, Today the truth prevailed. The truth could not be buried by mudslinging politicians or their powerful benefactors. I've said many times, seek the truth, and this is what was accomplished. He, he's calling this a sham impeachment coordinated by the Biden administration with liberal House Speaker Dade Phelan and his kangaroo court that has cost taxpayers millions of dollars, disrupted the work of the Office of Attorney General, and left a dark and permanent stain on the Texas House. And he's also uh, promising that, that the Biden administration needs to buckle up because your lawless policies will not go unchallenged. And he says his next address to the nation will be uh, next week on Tucker Carlson. So we're hearing now from Ken Paxton. And we also heard just a short while ago, um, a statement was put out by um, the governor, Governor Greg Abbott, uh, saying that the jury has spoken and Attorney General Ken Paxton received a fair trial as required by the Texas Constitution. And he looks forward to continuing to work with the Attorney General to secure the border and protect Texas from federal overreach. I want to bring in Bud, just. Well, gosh, you know, uh, uh, Paxton's statement just plays into what I was going to say about what Bob Hall said. You know, looking at this from the conservative uh, viewpoint, they say that Texas is the greatest state in the union. It's conservative beacon for the whole nation, sets the bar for America, and the Texas Senate in particular sees itself as what's keeping all of America from going liberal. That the Texas Senate's promoting the most conservative laws, the most conservative policies to keep Texas conservative, keep Texas red, and keep America red. That if Texas ever goes blue, then that's the last big state. The Republicans won't win again. The Texas Senate, those 31, well, the, the, the Republicans in the Senate see themselves literally as holding the, the, the wall together against a whole democratic takeover of America. Uh, they feel like they want to promote conservative policy. And then you get into uh, what Paxton said. Uh, he's turning this all on Joe Biden and say that his ambition now, now his, uh, his role as political attorney general, uh, he's going to try to make Texas more conservative, promote conservative politics, use this bully pulpit to go after Washington, go after Joe Biden, and be more higher profile than ever before. What do you think we're going to see next? I mean, are we going to see a, a real fight, a, a, even a greater fight within the Republican Party, Matt? You know, I just going back to Patrick's words at the very end of this in a statement, I mean, he just called out and attacked Representative Leach um, for what I thought was very authentic and powerful words and sincere. Um, and then attacked the House managers, attacked the House itself and its process. Um, I, that's the reason I come back to. This is, this is Republican fratricide. And I think this is happening in a lot of places, not just in Texas. I mean, we, we saw Mitt Romney decide this week that he could no longer be, run as a Republican and would not uh, run for the Senate again. Uh, you know, he made a statement recently about Trump's second impeachment that other Republicans came up to him and said that they were fearful for their safety if they had voted uh, to impeach uh, Trump. So I think it's interesting that this is not just happening in Texas, it's happening on a national stage. And I think the Republican Party is still going through this um, civil war internally about where are they going to be going in the in the future uh, and as to go back to your comments but about uh, Patrick you made the reference of the way the way it used to be in this country um, that uh, I guess the other parts of the country word. it is it the way is it used to be in this country was very different that's right for a lot of different groups and a lot of different people um, but I think it'll be interesting to see going forward is, is how does this, you know, with the Republican-controlled Texas uh, House uh, versus the Senate, um, you know, I've got to tell you, the, the House really did a service to the state by investigating this. Um, you know, Patrick wanted this to sound like a rush to judgment, but... This, this evidence has been around for over three years. It was over three years ago that these deputies walked out of the Attorney General's office down to the FBI's office to turn all this evidence over. Um, you know, uh, 
And here, you know, Paxton in his office wrote a 400 page report wanting to put it all out there. So I think, um, you know, until this all came up with the payment of the settlement, which kind of triggered that somebody needs to do something about this because those House Republicans didn't want to go into their next election thinking that they may be held responsible for having made this payment uh, of what Paxton and his and what his uh, judgment had done. But this is this is a, just not a big question mark here in Texas. It's a big question mark going nationally. What is the Republican Party? What are their policies? What is their platform? And where are they going? I don't know if there's any more answer, any more question about that. I think <laughs> the, that was made clear in 2016. I think it's still clear, and I, I think that the, you know any battle in the Republican Party is quickly being extinguished. Well, let's talk about one thing we have not discussed is uh, the two senators who consistently voted in favor of removal. Bob Nichols uh, and Kelly Hancock. Talk to explain that to our viewers. What happened there? Rob Nick, uh, Robert Nichols is from East Texas. He's considered a leader on transportation. Actually, you know, is the chairman of the transportation committee. He is often um, a bit of an antagonist. He, he's he's uh, he's always voted with Republicans, but he's always kind of the the uh, sticking point. He says, "Well, why are we doing this again? And is this really what we need to do? Not on social issues, but often on other issues." You know, he'll raise his head. He's probably the, the, there's not really anybody who dares be antagonistic to Dan Patrick in the Senate, but he does raise questions sometimes. Kelly Hancock from uh, Tarrant County, North Richland Hills, Kelly Hancock he had a powerful chairmanship of the Economic Development Committee, but he dared buck Dan Patrick on a couple of votes. He took Greg Abbott's side on a couple of occasions when Governor Abbott and Dan Patrick differed. Um, you know, Kelly Patrick, uh, Kelly uh, Hancock was seen as Governor Abbott's voice in the Senate, and so Dan Patrick stripped him immediately of his chairmanship and busted him down. Uh, he still represents North Tarrant County, and he still votes with the Republicans on everything. Has been huge on uh, you know anti-abortion law in Texas and everything else, but he's just on Dan Patrick's bad list. Hmm. Okay, so what, what do we think happens now to this whistleblower settlement? Uh, well, and I'll make the point that the state of Texas pays settlements for all of its agencies routinely, and it pays much larger settlements off. But do we get the legislature to approve it? This is a $3.3 .3 million settlement, and now you've had um, the Texas Senate decide, make their decision on uh, this. I, I think it goes unsettled. I think this all goes back to, to court again because the state won't pay. And, uh, you know, Ma Matthew could you know, correct me on what happens, but if, if you agree to a settlement but it's not paid, then it all has to be renegotiated. Is that right? That's right. And um, and now, you know, if I were some of these deputies from the AG's office, uh, based upon the statements in this proceeding that they lied, uh, that they made things up, that they falsified information, uh, I think they've got a great individual case for slander. Um, and so uh, I'd, I'd package that up and and uh, you know, swing for the fences and go for a much higher number now. Interesting, and, and I, want to, I want to kind of recap what we know. So there were 16 articles of impeachment, 12 of them ended in a 14 to 16 vote um, to acquit. Um, there was one, Article 4, which had to do with this allegation of disclosing um, undisclosed information allegedly to benefit Nate Paul. Now that was, um, he was acquitted on that one by a really lopsided margin. It was two votes yes and 28 votes nay. So, and then the rest of them, pretty much it was that 14 to 16 margin. But you called this one. Well, I mean, I wish I'd gone ahead and thrown in and said once, once it's 20 to 10, then it's going to be a wider margin. I wish I'd thrown that in too. But I said all along that I felt like that it would be dismissed. And I, I have said all along that I thought it would be by a vote. And from what I can tell, from what the Democrats are saying, it was, you know, by one or two votes, and then the other Republicans piled in. So uh, I just didn't see how the Senate. I think everyone watching this trial needs to understand. Maybe you've never seen this before. A lot of reporters have never seen this before. This was a typical day in May in the Texas Senate. This is what the Texas Senate is like from January to May every other year. Gavel, 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 
party line votes, party line votes, party line Lock votes, no matter what the topic is. They go through the cold weather of January, the cold weather of February, the blossoms start coming out, the flowers bloom in March. Austin is beautiful in March. Nothing changes inside that Senate chamber. April, May, it starts getting hot. You start getting down to the end of the session. Is the Senate going to pass any House bills at all? You know, Dan Patrick hated Dade Phelan before this ever came out. The Senate, the Senate just sits on anything that the House wants. And then, you know, Dade Phelan will you'll find some way to leverage a little action out of the House. And occasionally even they'll show up together on something. But then you get down to the final rush and it's, you know, Dan Patrick is the king and what Dan Patrick says rules. And as we saw maybe after the trial, maybe this wasn't such an impartial king after all who ruled in this trial and made decisions about who was going to testify and not testify. Well, he certainly, um, that did feel like a statement that was prepared. I do want to reintroduce you guys. Um, this is Bud Kennedy from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram and Matt Yarbrough, uh, former federal prosecutor, and you also served in the Attorney General's office under John Cornyn. Um, you, you worked, since you worked in that office, just talk to me about your thoughts on what you heard about the way that office was functioning. Uh, John Cornyn's? Well, no, and Ken, under Kim Paxton compared to okay. what you experienced. Oh, God, just night and day. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I think, when we, when we started this over a week ago, is, is that John Cornyn had great deputies, wonderful people, and he really bring, believed in bringing people from both sides of the aisle. So, in fact, his criminal chief is the fantastic SMU ethics professor, Linda Eads, who served as his civil chief. Uh, he knew that she was a Democrat, and he wanted her, uh, her on his staff, mainly because of her background with the state bar and commitment to ethics. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, Mike McCall was one of um, uh, John Cornyn's right-hand, uh, you know, top deputies, uh, just a solid human being, really ethical uh, lawyer and great lawyer. Uh, I just night and day looking at how that office was run compared to uh, this one here where consistently the Attorney General is putting his own lawyers in very difficult positions. You might have heard some of this on the witness stand a little bit that many of them began to think about what well, not only is this unconstitutional what he's asking me to do, I think it's a crime, I think it's immoral, but remember, each one of those lawyers is still licensed before the State Bar of Texas. So even if they were to follow orders, they may have a duty to raise the issue under their own bar license or know that they would be risking their license and be disbarred. So each one of them, you could see them struggling with that as they were talking about it on the witness stand. You've heard comments like, this is a lawyer ethics 101, I believe that's one of the witnesses said. Every, every lawyer in the state of Texas that goes to an accredited American Bar Association Law School must complete the professional responsibility bar test before their third year in law school. Um, and so many of these issues that were raised here, like obstruction of justice, not uh, intervening into a grand jury matter or a, uh, a matter in which there is a sealed uh, search warrant affidavit by a federal judge, I'm sure these all of these lawyers were just thinking, I'm not going to have a bar card by the time this is all over and done with. So that's how I would the juxtaposition between those two different offices. Matthew, what's the debate like in the legal community? Uh, we've just gone through the, the continuing fallout from the Trump election challenge where uh, you know, Rudy Giuliani, uh, you know, Sidney Powell locally, who's uh, who's closely tied to a lot of uh, prominent Republican donors in Dallas. Uh, some of them admitted that everything they brought to court was made up. Uh, you know, it, it, is the legal community fracturing just like the rest of America about, about what's, uh, what's fake news and what's true? Um, I don't think so. I, I think, you know, with a lot of people today, if you have your own position and you want to hear that point of view, that's all you really focus on and listen to. You don't really go out to other sources. Um, I, I kind of see more of a consensus of the legal community coming together. As you've probably seen, um, great article in it, The Atlantic by uh, Professor Tribe from Harvard and, um, and the conservative justice, I'm, I'm blanking his name, Ludig, Judge Ludig, um, uh, from, uh, they together they've written this article basically about uh, 
the articles of where you can file before state to bar a presidential candidate, basically if they were an insurrection or they aided and helped in that. So it's interesting to see people from the Federalist Society, which is so conservative, and many of these young or middle-aged lawyers were part of. Right. Um, these were these also look very conservative guys. Right, and I think the combination of the Federal Society, uh, these uh, people have put out these, a lot of these great articles, along with people like Lawrence Tribe, is not thought of as a conservative, very liberal. You're kind of beginning to see a lot of the uh, legal community come together, I think, in that realm. And I want to uh, bring up that uh, Senator Ted Cruz has put out a statement. Um, he is congratulating Ken Paxton on, quote, being acquitted of every single article of impeachment. This was the right outcome, consistent with the will of voters. I look forward to seeing Paxton back in office, continuing to serve as the most effective conservative AG in America. Um, Bud, what do you expect to see out of Ken Paxton once he starts back on the job? Well, and I think Ken Paxton now is, is a political figure and not the head of a law firm. And I think that, that we see through some of this that maybe Ken Paxton isn't that good at being the head of a law firm. Uh, you know, he obviously will be campaigning and leading Texas's challenges to the Biden administration, as he says to the to the Biden FBI and the Biden Justice Department. Uh, Texas will continue to challenge every move. Uh, we have the you know, the, the uh, discussion along the border. You know, we have the debates about uh, health care funding. You know, everything about. Uh, tell whether federal courts will have any say so over uh, issues in Texas prisons, uh, you know, uh, in uh, health care, uh, uh, child care. There, there are so many issues where Texas and the federal government are at odds. I think he'll continue to just go on every stump across the country and talk about how he stood up to the Democrats and won. He s stands up to the Biden administration. He stands up to the Justice Department. I think he. You know, this is all campaigning for 2024. You see him running on the national stage next? I don't see him running on the national stage because there are not many places you can run with this record outside of Texas. But The, uh, the other thing too is I'm not sure how Paxton would do when he, um, you know, in these Texas elections he doesn't have to do a lot of uh, debates and public appearances and I'm not sure how well Paxton would do in a national sort of election uh, for U.S. Senate, let's say, or some other office where he would have to have take on an opponent, debate, and present. I don't think he's going to come across as well. You know, the other thing that uh, Dan Cogdell brought up um, when he, in his statements is he was talking about those securities uh, charges that uh, Ken Paxton still faces down in Harris County. Those are the charges. He, he was indicted back in 2015 on two first degree felony counts and also the a third degree felony count. And he was basically saying that uh, they needed to think about uh, just getting rid of those charges and dismissing them and making them go away. That was, I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Um, I what? wanted to ask Matthew about that too. Are there any situations in the law where the jury can just vote and say, make this go away? No, no, especially since he's uh, been indicted on this. So you've had a, a grand jury return indictment, and so, uh, you know, the, it has to go forward. Now, granted, um, they could move to dismiss the case, but I don't see that happening. It's, it's in the process, and, and uh, I guarantee you Cogdell's probably looking forward to that next trial. Well, and, and the, what, what it, where that stands is that the Texas Supreme Court ruled, uh, I think it was back in May, May or June, um, on the issue of venue because there was this fight that lasted all oh, several years about should it be in Collin County, should it be in Harris County. Obviously, Collin County would have been better ground for Ken Paxton, but the Texas Supreme Court, which is Republicans, it is. voted to leave it down in Harris County, and so we're expecting a trial on that uh, based on just a little reading the tea leaves probably sometime early next year but it's really hard to say you know I mean if when he when the indictments came down in 2015 I didn't think we would still see them you know go still ongoing in 2023 so you know it's kind of right. hard and, to predict and, these things. And Harris County is going to be a less favorable uh, jury pool for Ken Paxton. Remember back during COVID uh, Paxton was like suing Harris County every other day whether it was over COVID or whether it was uh, drive drive-in voting or 
other issues like that. He was filing lawsuits one after another against Harris County. So, and again, taking Ted Peck's side on that, that, that is a securities violation that has already been adjudicated by the Securities Commission. He's already well, acknowledged. Well, that's, well, most that's of the third. It. That's the third degree felony thing. Right. That has been adjudicated. That right. that issue. So he's already acknowledged much of it. It's this has not been never in records been prosecuted as a criminal offense in Collin County. Can't find anywhere in the state of Texas it's ever been prosecuted. It does seem to be prosecuted only against Ken Paxton. Well. Okay, I, I know a little bit about that one because I've covered it. Uh, the third degree felony count, which has to do with the failure to register, you're correct. Uh, actually, when he was a state rep, he actually voted to make that the law in Texas that if you fail to register, you can be charged criminally. He did acknowledge that, and that is what that charge relates to. The first degree felony charges relates to a different situation uh, having to do with a company called Servergy. Um, and there was a, a, a state representative that he got to invest in that, and there are allegations. A Republican. That, a Republican. Right, that, yeah, and so. Accused of defrauding a fellow Republican. And, and, and those are, you know, it's a fairly complicated case, but it basically has to do with that he was being paid with stock um, to get others to invest and that he didn't tell people about it. He wasn't so, disclosing it. Right, and that's the issue there, that, that failure to disclose. And so, you know, we'll see how that all turns out. Um, you know, just as we kind of begin to wrap up, um, I just want to kind of get y'all's, um, start getting kind of final comments, final thoughts. I mean, I, you know, regardless of, of where you stand on things, what we saw this last couple of weeks was definitely historic. Um, yeah, I mean, if it happens in another hundred years, we won't be here for it, you know? But uh, uh, I think, you know, uh, looking at this, I, I kind of come up with the takeaway being that this is very different from the other two impeachments we saw at the national level. And I come back to this being Republican fratricide and Patrick calling out the House uh, at the very end of this. I mean, you know, it's in a real trial. Uh, the federal judge at the end of the case doesn't give his opinion to the jurors. Um, so this was, you could tell, as, you, uh, as we all agree, I, this was in the can and they have, were gonna take this tack, the sort of a rush to judgment sort of theme on their accusations of it. But I think this makes this a very unique event, not just in Texas history, but to watch the Texas Republican Party sort of this infighting that's gonna be going to the next level, it appears, going into the next special sessions. Well, first of all, I, I, this is more your category of mind, but this is an important part of the justice process, that uh, indictment is only suspicion uh, you, know, you know, some evidence uh, that a crime might have been committed or that a violation might have been committed, and it's presented then and prosecuted before a jury, and the jury has to make that decision. Well, but but it, they has to be approved before a grand jury, right? and you have to meet the probable cause level. Right, so the House decided there was probable cause, and then what we saw here was the Attorney General you know, brought to account and, and uh, brought to court over uh, some of these things that happened that may have been loose circumstances, but they you know, appeared to all be coordinated to benefit uh, you know, one or two people. Uh, so uh, there was a trial, uh, the Attorney General was brought to account, you know, the proof, evidence was presented and refuted. All that process is the way it's supposed to happen. And then the, the jury made its decision, the jury is made up of politicians, uh, just as the House is made up of politicians who make political decisions for political reasons. You, uh, you have to remember that. Uh, uh, despite what was said, the Bush era in Texas is not over. Are you sure? Uh, I think that we'll see that. Okay. Well, uh, we're also, what, one of the things we're waiting on right now is that the House Board of Managers um, is supposed to be coming out pretty soon. Uh, I believe they're setting up. Let's we'll see if we can see the podium there. We're waiting on them to come out. And, you know, Dan Patrick really, really attacked them. I mean, they, I mean, they, I mean, fellow Republicans. So uh, just I'm curious what y'all think about that. I mean, are these the these Republican House Board of Managers going to face um, primary challenges? Are these 60 people that are, are and the other Republicans that voted for this? Some of them already do face primary challenges yeah, I mean, or will. Uh, the others will be questioned, but I, you know, they'll they'll say, hey, look, you know, look at all this. I mean, there was a lot to go on. We sent it over to the Senate. We don't know what they did with it. So 
Uh, I think that there are other issues that are more important to the voters, taxes, vouchers. You know, there, there are other topics that will come more into play in the primary than what they did or didn't do to Ken Paxton. There might be a couple of swing races where the, uh, they attempt to put up some sort of America First candidate uh, to challenge, but that really is very rarely successful. We always see that these these threats that there's a fracture in the party and the the, you know, the, the conservative challengers, the Tea Party, the Freedom Caucus, whatever label they're going under this week that they're going to take over. They always go out, they spend millions of dollars of West Texas oil money, they win a couple of seats, they lose a couple of seats, and they come back with another 10 seats in the House and nothing changes. What, what do you think happens with uh, Representative Leach, though, and Andrew Murr? I mean, they were pretty front and center here. Uh, nothing at all. I think they're both pretty strong in their district. Mm -hmm. You know, Representative Leach and the people of Collin County, uh, uh, you know, have have uh, you know, have voted pretty strongly. So. Well, it would be interesting to see. I mean, it, it, he's he, home among the people. He's not out traveling around doing a man. <laughs> Speaking of Tucker Carlson, that's right. what talking about, yeah. Right. Not the Bushes. Speaking of, right, speaking right. of Tucker Carlson. Um, Matt, uh, but I think you're, you have to go do. I have to go tape our Sunday show. I know. He's got, he's, uh, uh, Bud has got to get up here in a second and go tape Inside Texas Politics, which is our, our uh, show that's going to run tomorrow. If you all will be viewing at 9 a.m. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to excuse Bud and then Matt and I can continue because I have to, I have to, because um, you did tell me you had to leave it too. So okay. I'm, Thank I'm, you. just be sure to turn that mic off. Um, but as you can see, we've got a live look there, the, the, the seal of Texas there. We're waiting on the House impeachment managers uh, to come out and, um, you know, talk and see what they have to say. Um, Matt, what, what are you expecting we might hear from them? You know, I'm very interested to hear this, you know. Um, I, they were attacked, you know, Representative Leach and Representative Murr, and um, I can't wait to hear their response, especially the attacks Patrick had on the process in the House. I wonder if they'll respond to that with some comments. Um, you know, I think part of it is, is because they really did present, um, you know, sort of a, you know, Detective Joe Friday kind of case, just the facts, bam. And uh, I thought they did a very good job of that. And that might be one of the things they're going to say here is, we had this evidence before it was we brought it directly it was not based upon triple hearsay we put the actual witnesses under sworn testimony before the senators for them to make their judgments we put the documents out there before them uh, so i wonder if they're going to defend the case they put on to say you know we didn't we didn't have our lawyers uh, harden or daguerre get up and do an hour opening um and give a political speech the way Busby and Cog Cogden did. Um, they got up and used 10 to 15 minutes of their opening and they talked about what their case was about uh, and the pursuit of the truth and doing the right thing. Um, if you remember, Murr brought up the, the, old, uh, the old Sam Houston quote, you know, right. in the beginning and then also in his close. And so that part of it, I'm expecting to hear about that that they put on in good faith evidence, direct evidence, um, because almost zero hearsay got let into this case. Even stuff that was not hearsay got pushed out and was ruled by Patrick not to come into the case. So uh, that, that reference to triple hearsay, I find absolutely shocking um, when the witnesses were there before them. Um, you know, I, one of the things that I'm still kind of reeling about is, is um, how do all those witnesses feel now? Because if you remember, Representative Leach said, so, you know, Ranger Maxwell, uh, look into the, the former AG deputies. We hear you. We see you. Okay, let's take a listen to 